I wanted to talk today um, about the circumstances regarding George Floyd. Not about what happened in the video, but about why it happened, how it happened, and why it's probably going to happen again. And I'm old enough to remember the Los Angeles uh, City riots over Rodney King. So this is nothing new in the United States, it's just that nothing has changed, allowing the same sorts of circumstances to repeat, it, repeat themselves. Um, so I, I actually know a little bit about law, a little bit about politics, and the main reason this continues to happen is not only because of segregation based on race within American history, uh, but because of the political structure. And since most of us can either agree or disagree about the uh, causes of racism, we want to set that aside. And we just want to talk about the something we can all find common ground um, over. And what I want to talk about is how the collapse of local institutions have uh, has happened over time, especially over you know since 9/11, when local departments all over the all over the U.S. began coordinating not only with Washington D.C., uh, in other words, the Department of Justice, uh, Department of Homeland Security, which was made after 9/11 in order to coordinate all the different uh, police departments all all over the U.S. Uh, but also with international governments. The NYPD coordinates with international governments um, as well. And there is one of the biggest issues, we can actually, let's start at the top. Um, we can go back to a simpler time and understand several things. Number one, we should be able to, able to agree upon the fact that police have always meant to be a local institution answerable to the locals. And that's in part why uh, the financial industry is located in New York City, because they're in some ways not necessarily unaccountable, but you know when you have the DA and the police working together, the chances that anybody with any time a banking CEO would get arrested, it's probably not going to be in, in New York City. At, by the same token, the chances that someone will, a celebrity will be arrested in Los Angeles, let's say hypothetically an OJ Simpson, uh, over a domestic violence issue, or Bill Cosby, etc., uh, the chances of that actually happening, uh, be, you know, are, are a little bit lower, because these are local institutions answerable to the locals. These days, what that means in an era of, you know, in an era where tax local taxes don't pay for local institutions like the police or the firefighters, where you have a lot of diverse funding, you know, sources, what that really means is that the local character of the city is oftentimes split between multiple stakeholders. And the primary issue has been not only that nationaliz nationalization that I talked about, uh, you know, since 9-11 leading to divided loyalties, uh, but also the funding. So if the DHS is able to give, you know, say San Jose Police Department a funding grant, or let's, that might be not be the best example. Let's, let's talk about a smaller department, Indianapolis, you know, something smaller um, that doesn't necessarily get, you know, um, you know, the same revenue from local citizens. In part because maybe housing prices are a little bit lower, so the taxes from those houses don't necessarily increase over time um, in the same way they would in a place like San Francisco or Los Angeles, etc. So what you see right away is that number one, that local link is in some ways able to create bias, but it's always towards the local population. And it's also responsible for some corruption, which is why you have checks and balances. That's precisely why you have a federal agency so that you know when if the, if the locals are corrupt, then, the federal, then in that case, the feds would have the ability to come in and fix the problem. Now, this is just, once again, is nothing new. We recognized this quite some time ago and although and one of my favorite movies is Mississippi Burning with Gene Hackman and William Defoe. And what, what's interesting now, that movie was extremely dramatic, no, dram no, had it fictionalized a lot of what actually happened, but the core of it is true. And in that case, you had, you know, essentially uh, people that got murdered, outsiders that came in and were murdered by the locals because they thought the outsiders were going to cause trouble. Uh, and in fact, they were simply civil rights advocates. Um, in this case, right, so again, it's not right because the people that came in 
uh, that were murdered were not all African American in Mississippi. The civil rights people were, you know, in in, in, in that movie, you'll see that they were not black, um, at least not all of them. So it's not really a racial issue, right? You have this. You have to look at it in the terms of local versus national, right? And when the and when these things don't work, when the checks and balances don't work, you have a lack of accountability and therefore corruption. And ultimately, of course, we can talk about the dehumanization of, of different groups within the U.S., but again, we don't want to talk about that because it's not something that is going to help find common ground. So once you realize that in the past, a local police officer, when, they, when he or she wore that badge, was beholden to the local community and therefore had an interest in living in that community and also in, you know, in knowing who was in that community. And it was a two-way street. You couldn't really solve crimes. Remember, we didn't have CCTVs and surveillance everywhere. We didn't have cell phones. So the police were in some cases dependent on the local population for tips and to solve crimes. In the same way, it, it, and by the way, even with surveillance, the Unabomber was discovered, Ted Kaczynski, was discovered not by the police or the FBI. It was discovered through a tip. So that tells you right away that even with surveillance, you still need the assistance of the locals. And once again, if you have a situation where the feds are able to grant more money than the locals take in um, from taxes, and then on top of that, you have a budget each year that fills in any deficit from uh, either a bank loan, a government loan, a grant, um, or some sort of external revenue that is not connected to the local community, to the local citizenship, you've got a problem. And you can see right away why so many groups are marginalized, right? You have um, you know, illegal immigrants, uh, undocumented workers, and so on. They don't, the known, the, the knock is that they don't pay taxes, and so that's why they're so vulnerable. It's not only, it's not only that they are, a min they are a minority, it's the lack of taxation that gives the police and law enforcement a lack of interest in this group. And so we tend to think, because the United States has such a, has such a history in terms of slavery, which, by the way, was imported from Catholic Spain and Portugal. It's not something that's necessarily endemic. It was something that was imported. Um, and, of course, it continued. I mean, of course, it's, look at the cities in, in Cal just in California, San Jose, Santa Clara, the Spanish names, San Diego. Um, the word uh, Negro is just for black. So the people that were in, came from Spain, um, you know, they're white. They just decided, you know, as part of this, you know, sort of process of dehumanization. It didn't it just looked at somebody else and said, well, you know, that, that we're going to call this whole group by the skin color. So, but that's not something that's European. It's not American. Um, when I think about America, I think about Muhammad Ali and Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. Um, you know, I think about those people, those to me are, are Americans. Um, and what, what is interesting, even aside from all this, is once again, you have a situation where if we don't understand the causes of what is happening, we're never going to, be, we're going to be able to fix it. So I want to talk a little bit more about that, right? But first, you can see that you have local problems with the budget. The, budget's, the budget no longer represents local interests. It's a diverse in, you know, group of interests. And in many cases, if you're in a job within that police department, which, by the way, is massive, um, if, if you, I mean, you have to, you have to think about the, the, just how many people are within the prison system, who, uh, and, you know, just, you know, in the United States, that's 5% of the world population, something like 20 to 22% of the world's jail, prison and jail population. So within that, you've got to think about this whole infrastructure, right? You've got private prisons, um, and it's just, it's, just a, it's just a whole economy unto itself. And I think these are issues that have been fairly well explored. So I don't want to talk, get too deeply, so I don't want to talk too deeply, in, you know, about them because you can get them somewhere else. Um, but number one, in the old days, you bought a house that you paid taxes, not only property taxes, but sales taxes. The police knew, well, you're a homeowner. If I knock on your door, you're the one paying my bills. There was an element of respect. Also, we both have an interest in keeping this community safe. So we're on the same side. All of a sudden, post 9-11, you've got international groups coming in. You've got all this, you know, you've got funding, you've got grants. And suddenly you have a situation where the, there's divided loyalties. The second issue is that police are unionized. So in many cases, the typical laws do not apply to them. It, the, the laws that apply on the employment side are through negotiation, or through a contract that is negotiated by the groups, the, the negotiator for the police union and the city. There's a problem. The police help elect the mayor. They have lobbies just like everyone else. They're the ones that help 
elect the mayors or the people on the city council to at some point turn around and negotiate with them. So me, that, home, that homeowner does not have, is, is dispersed. They don't have an interest group that's sitting there trying to figure out how to increase jobs within the local police department or how to maintain jobs within that police department. And based on, remember what I said earlier, if you're in a position, position where I, as a homeowner, am already paying a lot of money in taxes, I don't want to pay more taxes. Well, where's that extra money going to come from to expand? So if you're in, if you're in the police, suddenly that homeowner who's not paying some more taxes over time, what ends up happening is that suddenly you're in a position where it's not that it's competitive, but you, you, you once again have divided loyalties because now your job isn't based on your relationship with that homeowner exclusively or that taxpayer buying something in the store exclusively. Now you think, you're thinking to yourself, well, I need to figure out where I'm loyal to so I can get a job, or I can at least maintain my job and my pension. Um, and once again, if that money isn't coming from the local community, if it's coming from a bank system and loans uh, or some other you know, outside outsider, you've, you have a problem. But the other problem is that you have a national organization now. You have so many different fraternal orders, and these orders all talk for themselves. So if something passes that protects uh, a police officer's union or that is advantageous to the police officer's union somewhere in New York, there's a good chance it'll come next door in your, in your city at some point because it, it got passed, it, it favors the police, uh, and the you know, police can always say national security, especially after 9-11, they can always say security, 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 safety. And people, even myself when I was younger, would vote for that. We would trust the police. We would vote if a police officer or police officer's chief would say, we need this. People like me growing up said, okay, uh, you know, I, let's do it. Uh, why do you have, what's your incentive to lie to me? And of course, once you figure out all these other things about the budget, about the divided loyalties, suddenly things start to make a little, hopefully start to make a little bit more sense. Now, um, Again, you have the uh, the self. That's the first issue. The second issue is th you know you have the negotiation problem, where that employment, the employment terms, including discipline, including privacy, um, of the police officers' files, are suddenly not something that's passed by your local congress or your local legislature. They're passed by an agreement on top of the, whatever laws are passed that deal with citizens or or, or other people within that community. And so again, you have different layers, right? You have national, state, local. Everyone's got a law, right? You have laws that are passed by the state. You have local ordinances. And all of these have to be enforced. Uh, so right away, you see how having three different layers of government also means you have to spend a lot of money maintaining the enforcement side of these laws. Because every law has, has to have some teeth to it. And on the civil side, of course, you have you know a lot of lawyers as well. Um, and so you have this sort of situation where you know you suddenly have the laws becoming more and more complex over time but here's the other problem in addition to that self-interested in, in, in addition to the divided loyalties and the fact that the, the lobbies for the city governments are oftentimes you know sitting across negotiating these employment and discipline terms from the very people that get them elected therefore weakening the ties to local citizens um, you have a, a lot of other problems as well so remember, divided loyalties on both sides, right? On both those issues. Just the very nature of the funding and then even the employment terms, which include discipline. Let's talk about the employment terms. Um, remember, you have three different layers. Chances, the chances of having anybody, anybody familiar with all three of them are, are zero, almost, almost zero, unless they work for the police. So, if, so you can see how if you go to any city in America, there's, there's usually only, only one or two people in that whole community that on the civil side, that with a private law firm that you can go to to sue the police. Why? First of all, it's expensive. Uh, you know, you, you, there are different laws. Once again, remember who's making the laws? The people, the lobbies are helping that, right? And lobbies are the ones that help elect the mayor and the city council. So they're the ones that have a greater say in what goes on, especially after 9-11, because people like me, they vote to say, right, do you want this? This makes, what, uh, what, what reason do I have not to trust you? You know, um, let's go ahead and, and do it. And you, you know, you, you look at this process, right, within the laws. The reason that you only have that, that you only have these sorts of issues is because it's not only expensive, but the, the even the statute of limitations is different, it's shorter. In some cases, in most cases, if something happens to you, you have either one year or two years to sue. Um, and with, with respect to suing your own governments, 
months. In, it's sometimes only six months. And, and, and this isn't something that the average person knows. Uh, hell, you can, might be, if you don't, can't make bail, you might be in jail for quite some time. Um, the other problem is that, you know, in addition to that, that the lobbies on the local level, because of that divided loyalty issue and the budgetary issues, um, even the so-called independent auditor that's supposed to supervise, you know, supposed to be an arm that's more beholden to, to, the, to the local population and the police has an oversight function. In many cases, including San Jose, um, it's just, uh, I mean, they can't do anything. They can just make a suggestion. So, so the role of this so-called oversight agency is to make a suggestion to the local city council. And if the city council wants, it can act on it. It doesn't have to. So they, they, they basically, they're like academics, they issue a, a report. They can be as sincere as they, as they want, but they don't have any actual power. So once again, you see another layer of accountability, of just basic accountability removed. And then you got the transparency side. Try to, get, try to get access to a police file. You notice how every time these things happen, there's never, somebody ne never pulls up the police officer's file and says, this guy's been on the force for 25 years. There's been only one complaint against him. This is either I an isolated incident or something that's a pattern. That never happens. Why? because you can't get access to a police officer's personnel file. When I, if, if, I, if I'm a, an employment lawyer and I wanna sue, I can actually get access to your personnel file. And, and so can the other side in a lawsuit. We can file it, there's no prohibition against filing it, making it public. Um, there can be if there's, if, you know, but you know, there's, there's really no overall difficulty getting the access to your employment personnel file. Not for the police, there's special protections based on that negotiation between the city council and that contract between the city council and the police. And so you have this additional layer, right? You have local, federal, state, local, and then now you have another layer on top of it, which is a separate union system where they negotiate their own terms of pay, but also, right, that leads to problems with the pension side, um, you know, because you've got people elected for four years, for the most part, or maybe two years that are negotiating uh, terms and conditions that last 25 years over over the next 30 years, and they're not going to be in office to see the consequences. Um, so divided loyalties again, uh, but in that case, it's more attenuation. Now, um, first of all, I want to apologize. For, you know, you see me sort of like getting cotton mouth and dry mouth. Um, when I saw that video today, there's another video that came out today in Texas in Midlands, where some a grandmother came out to protect her grandson in front of their own lawn after the police drew guns on her grandson, who happened to be black, uh, allegedly uh, run a stop sign, was completely unarmed, um, and was holding was, was holding his hands out, out so that the police officers could see. Uh, and that's actually the first thing you want to do, whether you're pulled over at a traffic stop, you know, um, you want to show people your hands, the police officers your hands. You don't want to move your hands unless, you know, you tell the police officer, I'm moving my hands to get my license, which is located in my glove compartment. Can I do that? That's how you want to respond. It's, it's actually the Chris Rock. Chris Rock, one, my favorite comedian, has a whole skit on this. Um, and I want, to, I want to sort of apologize because, you know, I, I actually, you know, I'm out of the United States right now and I couldn't do anything today except, you know, I'll, I'll admit that I cried after seeing those videos. Um, and, and I also cried when I realized it's going to keep happening again. So um, let me try to get, get back to the, to the specific reasons. Um, so hopefully somebody else can try to, to try to help fix this instead of having some sort of video that, or sort of inflaming passions. Uh, so you go back, you have the divided loyalties, uh, you have the, the, the conflicts of interest when you're negotiating uh, complex employment terms. You have a situation where you have people in office for four years negotiating terms that in many cases last eight to 16 years on the, on the discipline side. Um, in some cases, you know, even longer because if you have a um, if you come to a standstill in negotiations for that MOU or CBA, that's, that those are the names acronyms for the terms that um, that are on top of the local other laws that you and I have to follow as lo as regular citizens. Um, and so those are essentially the employment terms between government employees and the um, it within yeah that's it. that's basically what they are. Dep you know depending on whether or not they're unionized. Uh, so you have you know this just cauldron of mixed interests. Uh, and then on top of that, you add on the 9-11 situation where now you've got the federal government coming in um, and, and throwing money around uh, in, the form of, in the form of grants, but not necessarily with more supervision. Typically when the government comes in and they offer money, 
uh, they're actually putting a restriction on the local government. They're saying, you can take this money, but you better do this. So um, you look at the highways, that's how they built the highways. You know, they said, all right, well, I mean, a lot of major projects in the US, especially say that you've got, you know, obviously the highways were built, uh, interstate highways were built by the federal government who paid for, uh, pay for it. Um, but, you know, you can imagine a situation where today, if you want to build something like that, you would have a, a buy-in. You would say, well, we, the feds, will, we're concerned about segregation. We want to build a, a train. We'll pay 80% of it. You pay 20% of it. And you go around negotiating. That, of course, doesn't happen. Um, the federal government's role is, you know, limited in some cases, but it doesn't have to be in the sense um, in that in those cases. And in fact, if you look at the government's attempt, attempts to reform education, uh, you look at No Child Left Behind. The government in the past tried to reform uh, the educational system. It, it failed. So now you have privatization. So the other layer that we're not going to talk about is how private security. A lot of times if a police officer is let go, they can just go, go to work in private security. If you're in private security, uh, let's say at a, at a sporting event, um, you know, you, you have to see once again that the local police are, in many cases, they're being paid by whom? Not the taxpayer. In that case, there's some law that says if you want to have an event that has more than 250 people, you have to hire somebody from the local police department. So once again, who's paying for that? So who are the police, you know, beholden to in that situation? It's not the taxpayer, it's not the local citizen, it's the corporation that's holding the event. And, and not only that, but the corporation is going to hold the event multiple times, thereby paying, and thereby creating that tax, that, that growth and, and employment, uh, just by passing a law. The, the city council passes after the police unions help the city council get elected. Um, I hope, yeah, I hope that's making sense so far. So you, on top of that, even despite all these issues, right, you could still have a situation where if you had good local newspapers, good local journalism, you could still kind of break through all this, right? Uh, it was a journalism, it, you know, you have a, if you have a whistleblower, that would work. Now, when I was growing up, I re remember seeing a particularly um, critical news, uh, newspaper writer uh, against the San Jose Police Department. Every article he wrote was damn good. He had to be getting in some sort of inside information. Within less than a year, he was gone. Haven't seen a single article from him since. Apparently he was hired by somebody in the police department uh, afterwards. Um, it's so once again, if you don't, if you can't, this is a typical pattern uh, all over the world. If you can't beat them, you know, you just co-opt them, you pay them off. Um, it's like a settlement agreement, you know, we'll pay you, come work for us, but you know, we'll just send you over there and you know, and you got paid, you're under a contract. So there's not a whole lot you can do at that point. So you see the collapse in local journalism. That was when the newspapers were popular. Back at that time, people would read newspapers. Uh, it would have an influence on that community, right? You got a San Jose Mercury News. Today, nobody reads San Jose Mercury News. You really, again, once again, you're stuck with national newspapers, right? The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, uh, magazines, the Atlantic, the Nation, things like that. Um, so once again, you have a problem because you have, again, a, another collapse in local institutions. And in that case, that was another level of, of accountability. That was another uh, opportunity for accountability. That's gone. If the newspapers, if the newspapers are gone, uh, now what? So let me go back to the difficulty, try to explain the legal side of it a little bit more. Um, so, so the other difficulty is even if you're an, an employment lawyer, you're not going to take these cases. Let's say, let's say I do employment law in San Jose. Somebody's clearly committed a uh, police brutality against you. You come to me. Well, you have to come to a small, a small shop. If you don't, the other guys want five, ten thousand dollars from you up front because uh, they, in many, it's, it's a difficult process. Remember, all, all, the, all the laws are stacked against you, and quite frankly, there won't be more than one or two people in the whole city uh, that handle these kinds of cases. It's not a popular thing to do. Um, you're, you're going up against the establishment, and you're trying to make money in the meantime. Um, and and in, in most cases, the people that come to you can't front the all the costs. So you got to take. So the other issue is how expensive it is. So so. Let's say you can't afford five thousand dollars. Now you got a problem. Unless you got it on video, um, you know you got a problem. Uh, so the, the ones that we see, the ones that make us, the ones that we know are tragic, are the ones we see on video. These are issues are not always taken on video. So it's just the ones we see. And Will Smith made a comment that you know, racism hasn't really changed, or you know, that much. Uh, it's just now captured on video more, so we see more of it. Okay. Um, but you have to understand, let, let's say you come to someone who's just a normal lawyer um, and not somebody who specializes because maybe you can't afford that person because you, have, you don't have the incident on video. Let's say you come to me, I handle employment law. Guess what? I, I can't help you. 
I, I specialize in employment law, but I specialize in employment law that applies to what's called the employment code. Well, you know, you got the health and safety code. You have a code for everything. You have the penal code. The penal code. That's that's a criminal criminal code. I can't help you because I don't I don't know the penal code. I know one. I'm an expert on. I might be um, if I'm doing that kind of law. You know, uh, you know, it's just one code. And that employment code, remember, does not necessarily cover the the. You know, I have to understand the CBA. So that, that employment code may cover an engineer working for Intel. It may cover a secretary working for somebody else. Um, but it may not necessarily, you know, it doesn't give me any insight into what the actual disciplinary terms are for you. Furthermore, there's what's called qualified immunity. I don't want to get too technical, but ultimately, you know, if, if you, the, it, the city councils make it difficult, more difficult to sue for these things on, a lo on local state laws. So you might have to file a federal lawsuit. Okay, which is called a 1981 or a 1983 federal lawsuit. Guess what? So state court, you can convict or win on a civil side, um, on the civil end of it, uh, uh, with a non with a majority, like either it's six out of nine or nine out of twelve. You don't need a, you, it. Does not have to be unanimous consent by the jury to get paid to get your hospital bills paid and so on. This is important because remember, if there's only a couple of law firms in the whole city, let's say even five of them. Uh, they're already overwhelmed, and you know it's 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 not something that is a, is an easy thing to to handle. So they have to get paid, and they have to get their lawyer fees back as well. Which, by the way, who, who does it come from? Taxpayers. Most cities are self-insured. That means they don't have a policy that pays out for them. So the so all this stuff is self-insured, which again gives them an interest, unless the evidence is clear, in fighting as long as possible. Because guess what? If you know if the police police officer loses. The worst, he still keeps his job, but the, and, and there's nothing that comes out of his pocket. It's a taxpayer that pays any settlement or any judgment or, or the verdict, the judgment that results from a verdict. So let's say you fought to, you know, let's say you don't even file a civil lawsuit in state court. Let's say in, in some cases you go to federal court because you might not trust the local jury pool. You might not trust the judges because who, by the way, just some judges are elected. Once again, if you can get people on the city council elected, you don't think you can get some judges elected too? Um, so you got to go to the feds, which are much more, uh, have, which the feds have, they have fewer cases. You go on, if you go to a state court and, and on Tuesday, you'll see maybe 25 cases, uh, you know, on the docket. Well, in federal court, there's six, sometimes there's two. And, you know, God bless them. The federal court systems, the judges are pretty good. They have a lifetime appointment. But one of the reasons they're pretty good is because they don't have, you know, it's not as if they're more special. It's just that. Uh, it is more difficult to become a federal judge, but there are bad judges there too. Uh, the difference, of course, is that they probably read all the papers. You know, one case could have th a thousand pages, and if you only have two cases that day, you probably read all of them yourself. If you have 25, you're not going to read all of them. Your, your clerk, your staff does it for you and gives you a memo. And so, you know, that you once again have that, that separation, further, further, further and further separation, which is why... Uh, many times nothing happens unless the media gets involved. Oh, whoops, that is, there's no local newspaper. Nobody watches the local news anyway on TV. Now what? So once again, you have a problem. But the other problem is on the federal side um, is that you have to have a unanimous jury just to get paid. You've got to have a unanimous jury. Um, you, you know, and so once again, you have a problem. So even if you go on the other side, which is supposed to be on the federal side, which is where if you have a good case, you might want to go there. Um, you know, you've got a problem because you, you have a, not necessarily a higher burden of evidentiary proof, but you have to have a unanimous situation there. So there's different rules. So you can see all these things stacking up. And until these, these the gap between, until local institutions are, are restored, none of this will change. You know, because remember, you can come to an honest lawyer um, and that person can't help you because even if they, if they know all the laws that apply uh, to employees of Intel and of McDonald's, they still can't help you because it's a totally different section of the law. And again, it's, you know, even if you give, give the guy $5,000, the honest lawyer would say, I can't help you. This is not my, my bailiwick. This is not my, my this is, you know, if I want to start, you probably don't want to start with me, even if I'm good, because I would have to learn a whole area of law and this is something I really want to be doing. Um, and in some cases, you know, when I can just refer you to the two or three lawyers or law firms, should be two or three law firms, 
you know, in, in the other side of the city that are, that are much, that have been doing this for 10 years and that, and that do have a good reputation. So you right away, you've got, it's just so, these sort of sorts of, not a monopoly problem. You just have a, you know, you don't have that many people that are into, into this sort of thing. So, and then you gotta have the $5,000, it's expensive. You know how, even taking a deposition, which is where you can call the police officer, you know, into, into your office or a third party location and ask him questions about what happens, you know, under per, a penalty of perjury um, in a civil case. Well, guess what? Minimum cost, because you have to pay for the court report of the type, type the responses. You might have to pay for the videographer, thousands of dollars. If it's, if it's at least a, a full day. We've got to reserve the room. Um, you know, so right away, you've got to, the, right away you see that there's, there might be even more cases than what you see, but if it's just a broken arm, you go down to the, to, down to the established players and, you know, you give them $5,000, well, they might, they might get a settlement, but, uh, you know, the settlement will be paid by the taxpayers and it just keeps happening because there's no accountability involved. I mean, there's no, there's no penalty. The, the, the power structure is not affected. Now, on, on, on the one hand, that's not necessarily a, you know, a bad thing because you want people in power uh, to be able to make decisions um, not based on what will happen in a lawsuit you know, two years later, but based on what, is, what they feel is right today. The problem is that that requires integrity, that requires honest people, that requires people to trust their local institutions. When you have all these other players involved um, on every level, judicial, local, state, police departments, city councils that don't necessarily operate or get paid based on the local citizens. Um, I mean, okay, well then you say, well, let's go, to, let's, let's get the Department, Department of Justice or the FBI, FBI to come in. Well, you know, the FBI, remember who guy called Hoover was spying on Martin Luther King, actually tried to get Martin Luther King to cause, you know, cause enough problems for him to the point where they taped him um, you know, having an extramarital affair, allegedly, and then played the tape back to him, um, and apparently left a message on his phone that was that his wife, that Martin, that Martin Luther King's wife, could access. So now what? You see that the funda fundamental fundamental problem is integrity, and of course, you know, you're not going to be able to fix that with a law or a videotape or any of that stuff. These are all extremely problematic situations that ultimately show you that all over America, whether it's Minnesota or LA, uh, and by the way, it, we know for sure that, that you know, LAPD, if you go back and look, there's a great uh, documentary called, um, about the OJ Simpson situation that was made by, uh, I believe it was Disney, one of Disney's uh, companies, subsidiaries. And um, it tells you very, right away that the LAPD has had major issues uh, for quite some time, far long before Rodney King. So these are things that keep building up on each other. And that's one of the reasons why OJ was, was left alone. Um, you know, not only because of the Hollywood sort of situation where that, those are the guys paying your bills. Uh, maybe, you know, you sort of try to try to settle it or sweep it on, on, under the rug if you can. Um, and was it The People versus OJ Simpson? Might have been the documentary, uh, the title of the documentary. Um, but these are all problems that have been happening for decades. It's not necessarily a racial problem. It's just that things have gotten worse since 9-11, uh, where the, the argument of security and trust us, um, you know, and combined with the diverse funding sources that weaken local ties, you know, create problems, especially when you consider the failure of local journalism that would operate as a separate um, check, check and balance aside from the, a, a federal investigation on local institutions. And then you've got the rise in private security. So you, and then you have people within that community that don't, that, that are, that already pay quite a bit of money in taxes and don't necessarily want to be taxed, which then drive local government employees, which who want to expand, that, which then drives them into other sources, whether it's loans or grants or private corporations and so on, which continues to weaken those ties to the individual citizen and the, and the indiv individual taxpayer within that local community. Until all these things change, uh, which means you would have to have a new funding system, you would have to try to prevent, you know, you would have to somehow cut off, you know, have, have one police department, and then how do you do that, right? You have freedom of association. 
well, are you going to try to ban, ban a local union in San Jose from talking to, to a local lawyer in New York or you know, Los Angeles, even within the same state? Uh, you know, because you know you want things to be local. What do you do when, when the state legislature says, "All right, well, these property taxes that you're paying, we want to have an equal system, so we're going to send all your all that up up north, to Sacramento, the state capital, and then and then through negotiations send it back down," so, which you know, which then also weakens the ties between the local community and the, the police department. So you see, over time, this weakening of the individual um, within American society. And that has led to, a, along with the, you know, sort of all these different checks and balances, especially the failure of journalism, uh, you know, which, you know, without some, having somebody um, who can sort of explain at least the legal things to you in a way that makes sense, you, you can't even identify the problem, you know, in order to fix it. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure what, what, what is going to happen at this point. Um, I can just tell you that, that you know, I, I've... You know, I, I was sad, obviously, when I saw the Rodney King video. Um, I was sad this week uh, when I saw the George Floyd video. Um, but this is going to keep happening. And uh, I'm not sure, even with what I know, I'm not sure what, what I can do about it. And I'm not sure if people in the, in the U.S. care enough to be able to look at the fundamental causes of what's happening and then try to fix it, which would require a whole top-down, bottom-up sort of um, systemic reform uh, to try to figure out what's in that budget. How do you expand? Maybe you want to have an, a, a tax once every four years. Uh, you would have to figure out what's going on with the negotiations with the city council, which are sometimes behind closed doors. Um, you know, who's going to pay? If, you know, how many police officers do, does each place need? How do you come up with a formula to figure out the growth of the police department, which, by the way, now includes... You have nurses on site. Remember, this is a huge industry now. Um, you have sometimes nurses on site. You have, uh, <laughs> we've got a secretary that try, does intake. Um, you, know, you have to buy cameras. Now you have surveillance systems. Now you've got to back up the software. you got to buy security for the software. You might have to hire, have IT. So you have a lot of growth, but not necessarily more boots on the ground, not necessarily more beat cops um, that continue to have ties to the local community or that may volunteer their time, like Joe Martin did in Louisville, Kentucky, when he took in Muhammad Ali to the boxing gym uh, that he was in charge of uh, part-time. So I uh, hope that, try, you know, so just to, you know, I hope all that helps. I'm not sure if it's gonna help, uh, you know, because you then you have to get into all these different institutional issues. Um, I don't know, I really don't know.